Invocation by Steve Prescott. Everybody stand, and then we'll have the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance. The invocation first. Who's under the pledge? The, the invocation. The invocation first, yes. okay. Sorry. Thank you. No, you're fine. <laughs> Father in heaven, we just thank you, Lord, for the chance to come together here tonight for this meeting. We pray that you would guide the council, the citizens in attendance, that this would be a blessing to all concerned, Lord, that you would just give wisdom to everybody present, and that when people leave here tonight, they would be blessed for having come. We thank you, Father, and we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. All right, we have a presentation, animal service presentation by Annette Patton, Executive Director, Stanislaus Animal Service Agency. Good evening, I'm the Executive Director for Stanislaus Animal Services Agency. Thank you for having me here tonight. I'm gonna to deliver to you our animal services uh, report. Stanislaus Animal Services is a joint powers agency. It became a joint powers agency approximately six, six years ago. At the same time, we represent the city of Modesto, Ceres, Patterson, Waterford, Houston, and the unincorporated area of Stanislaus County. Our board members here are the city managers that we represent, including Toby Wells from Ceres. Our budget is a little bit unique in that we're not a general fund department. We are uh, funded by actual partners, which is the cities in Stanislaus County. And how the budget is funded is we take all the expenses, and the expenses that you pay are based upon the animal intake. So for example, if you had 50% of the animal intake in our partners, you would pay 50% of the expenses. Then you get dollar for dollar credit to offset the expenses based upon all the revenue that your citizens spend for it be a fine, an adoption, a dog license, anything your citizens spend money on, we give you dollar for dollar to offset it. We have many partners with animal services, many that people probably don't even realize that we have, but we do rely on volunteers and partners to make the organization work or we wouldn't be able to function. One of our biggest programs is the Alternative Work Program. We support that program. These are AWPs that come in from the Sheriff's Department that need to do their hours. They come in seven days a week, including holidays. They sanitize all the kennels, they feed the dogs, and they water the dogs, and we logged in over 3,600 hours uh, in one fiscal year. We also have the court referral program known as the Community Services. We logged in 4,700 hours, and you can imagine this all translates into free labor for us as an organization. Our Alliance WorkNet program, we logged in over 5,200 hours. These are individuals who need some job training, and the Alliance WorkNet program is a, a program or a department through uh, Stanislaus County, and this is free labor. Also, the Hospital Student Program, these individuals are trying to become registered registered vet technicians, and so they logged in 4,200 hours. They actually work in the hospital. The picture that's shown here is actually our full-time um, staff. We have two registered vet techs, and then we have Dr. Cadwell, who's our <coughs> lead veterinarian. Volunteers, we are probably one of the biggest organizations when it comes to volunteer hours for Stanislaus County. We logged in over 7,000 hours, and these are individuals in the community that participate. So we have Augusta Farley. She represents the city of Patterson. She volunteers her time by offering free dog training each and every month for anybody who adopts an animal from Stanislaus Animal Services. Adoption Center, this is where all your college kids and high school kids, they want to come in and volunteer their time. They like playing in the Adoption Center, walking the dogs, socializing the dogs. We also have uh, social media. This is Lindy Love Haining. She is your representative for City of Ceres, who represents the Animal Services Advisory Committee, and she runs our social media Facebook for us. Uh, we also have Cat Country, who donates 100% of the airtime for the 12 strays of Christmas in the month of December, and all these animals get adopted. They put an animal each and every day for 12 days. Um, they sponsor an animal and get it adopted on the air. We have Eagle Scout Projects. These are individuals who come in and try to achieve their Eagle Scout project. We allow them some pretty hefty um, projects, actually, and they donate their time and money. Uh, we are working on cementing our backyards because we have lots of play yards in the back of the organization, and we cement them so that the uh, animals can't dig out. 
We also have a few individuals who have these elaborate birthday parties, and I'm talking 10 and 11 year olds, as you can imagine, and they invite all their friends and family to these birthday parties, and they ask to bring gifts to the animal shelter versus getting gifts themselves. So we get these big elaborate gifts from these individuals, and we in turn give them out as an adoption award when you actually adopt. We have the Stanislaus County Library Snuggles Program. And these are individuals, these are through the library that make all these elaborate blankets for the animals. We get over uh, a thousand of them a year, and then in turn they go out with the adoptable animals. We have a committee called the Animal Services Advisory Committee that is uh, sponsored by each member of the cities in the Stanislaus County. And then we have Animal Services Auxiliary, which is our 501c3, and they can actually raise money. Uh, animal rescue, many of us use the term out in the community, oh, I rescued an animal down the street, or I rescued an animal you know, in the community, or something got dumped off and I rescued it. We use animal rescue as just a different term altogether. It's a nonprofit 501c3 that is registered through the state. Uh, these individuals help us get all the animals out of the shelter alive. They are allowed to take animals from us at any given time at absolutely zero cost. We work with a lot of different rescues outside the county, and we also work with Stanislaus Humane Society, who is our main function and partner for the rescue for the TNR Community Cat Project. Our Community Cat Program, this is something that I'll elaborate on. Um, this is partially where the cats come in. We're not actually out there in the community trapping cats. We get plenty that come in from the community, and I'll explain that a little bit more, but City of Ceres is one of our um, biggest cat populations coming in by zip code. Um, so there are plenty of cats here in the City of Ceres that are not spayed and neutered. When we get them from the citizens, we actually spay and neuter them if they meet the criteria. Their ear is uh, tipped, which is the national sign for a cat that's been spayed or neutered, and then they're returned to the original habitat by the Stanislaus, and, um, Stanislaus Humane Society. We do offer what's called the cat stop. You'll see the picture of this cat stop. These are for individuals and we give these out to the community. If you don't want cats and you have every legal right to say you don't want your neighbor's cat on your yard or on your boat or anything in your yard, you have an absolute right to protect that. So we offer these cat stops at no cost to you. Uh, this is partially what it is. It's, it's just a little box. You put a battery in it and it will send out a sonar message basically only heard by the cat. It won't affect your dog if you have dogs, and it just keeps the cat off of your property. I have quite a few doctor's offices that use these in the city of Modesto and um, members in the community, because they don't necessarily want the cats euthanized, but they don't want cats right in their front door also for their customers, and we need to totally understand that. Uh, the fiscal impact to the agency, we've started this program now, we've done it for two years, was 30,000 is what I budgeted for to do 2,000 cats. And then we got grant money of 5000 the first year, and then we got a grant this past year of 15000 so I take that and offset it. Um, the whole overall goal, obviously, is we want bigger and larger grants, and we're trying to get a $100,000 grant now. And you'd say, well, what are you going to do with that money? We would be proactively out there getting all the cats in series and the boundaries close by and proactively spay and neutering these cats. This is the important slide because this is truly what the data shows. So if you look... Just on the chart on the left-hand side, this is what you saw at Animal Services for 20 years. The same thing over and over again. You had a very high cat intake. You had over 7,000 cats coming in. And 7,000 cats don't come in just through the year. Cats have a season. They come in historically May through September. You're going to get that many cats all at once because they procreate when it's hot. Um, if you come and want to say, oh, well, I'm going to adopt some young kittens in December time, I'm going to tell you that I'm going to run out because kittens aren't being born in the month of December. So for 20 years you had this very high cat intake, over 7,000, and you had a very high euthanasia rate, over 6,600. And this is the gross number, so I'm not going to tell you that we adopted out 1,000 cats because the truth really is in this community, we are not a cat adoption community. We're just not. We, ad we adopt plenty of dogs out in the community, but we don't adopt 1,000 cats out in a year. This is truly the gross number. So you may have an average of four to 500 cats that we can adopt in a year. And trust me, I try to give cats away. I run all sorts of promotions. I can't give them away. So if you look at the chart, we're pretty proud of the chart on the right-hand side. This is truly what we wanted to see, and we did see this the first year, and this is the number that I'm really monitoring and watching. So you have 2013-14. You still had that over 8,000 uh, cat intake. That's your base number for intake. Intake means cats coming into the shelter in that five-month time period. 
And then you have where we lowered the euthanasia rate down to 5,200, still a very high number of euthanasia rate, but we knew that we would decrease the euthanasia the first year because you're spaying and neutering these cats and releasing them back out to the community. So we really didn't have anything to compare it to until the second year, which is 2014-15. This fiscal year just ended. So again, you had 7,000 cats coming in for intake. So we reduced cat intake by 11% in one year. That doesn't sound like a really high number, but that's what your hope is. And when I shared this with uh, UC Davis, because those are the experts that we work with, they were impressed that we could actually even reduce it by that amount the first year, because it usually takes a couple years. And then we lowered the euthanasia rate. Again, still room for improvement, and this is the number that is truly the watchable number of the intake, because if the intake doesn't go down consistently, then there's no need to keep the program in place. We need to reevaluate it. So after one year of data, we can say that we reduced cat, cat intake by 11%. We reduced euthanasia rate down to 52%, down to. It was, if you know, remember the past slide, it was up over 80% at one point in time. And we're exploring more grant opportunities. We recently received two letters <coughs> where we were actually invited to participate and apply for a grant. Vaccination clinics. Historically, we used to come out into your community in series and do these vaccination clinics in the park. And I often get the question, why don't you do that anymore? And this is the reason why we had to send people away. We couldn't accommodate it because people just kept coming and coming and coming. And it didn't make any sense for us to go out on a Saturday to the park when Saturday is our absolute busiest day at the shelter. And it was requiring half of the staff to go out and it just didn't work as a business decision. So when we moved over to um, our brand new shelter, we thought this would be a really good way to get people out to the new shelter and explore. So as you can see, the numbers kept going up and up and up, and that's great. But people were literally waiting two and three hours to get their dogs vaccinated and their citation cleared because just of the volume of people. So when we reevaluated for this fiscal year, what we decided to do is we hold vaccination clinics at the shelter Monday through Friday, every day of the week now, and one Saturday a month. And I can guarantee you, you'll be in and out of there in less than 30 minutes now. Number of dog licenses issued, this is something that we have to watch. Uh, we've continuously gone up and up and up, and we've set some records the past couple of years on the number of dog licenses issued. This is what the state monitors on our compliance. And we continuously want to issue the number of altered license going up. That means your dog is spayed and neutered. It's only $12 for a dog license. If for a dog that is spayed and neutered, it's $150 for an unaltered because we don't want the population increasing with dogs. So for our business highlights, this past year we issued over 27,000 dog licenses. We automated our administrative citations, and what basically that means to us is, historically, if we sent you a dog license renewal letter and you completely ignored it, nothing would happen to you. And that always bothered me. So we have automated administrative citations. So if you get your dog license renewal in the mail and you ignore us, then you'll get what I call a friendly administrative citation in the mail. It's friendly because it's a fix-it ticket. You still have 30 days afterwards. If you don't fix it after the 30 days, then it does become a fine. Uh, we vaccinated over 5,000 animals. That's more than double than what we just did a few years ago. We reduced cat intake by 11%. We do neighborhood sweeps. We currently don't do any in series, but we're always open to the thought if you find that there's a location that we need to for dogs, not cats, for dogs. Uh, we do them currently in the uh, airport district every other month, and we do the other ones off of Crow's Landing every other month. Uh, we adopted out over 2,186 animals, and we sent over 4,200 to our licensed uh, rescues. Some of our future programs is we have uh, what's called the spay and neuter program. It used to be called the skate program. We changed it effective 7-1 of this fiscal year. And what that looks like is if you have proof of low income, we will give you a $50 coupon to take to any local veterinarian in the community. We pay the $50 as a reimbursement directly to the veterinarian, and um, the difference is paid by the citizen for their dog directly to the veterinarian. We have dog delivery. What that looks like is we offer dog delivery to rescues outside the county. Uh, a lot of times they have transport problems, and we want to get the dogs out of our shelter alive. That's our overall goal. Cat City. Now that we're talking about cats, um, and I've heard jokes about the cat cities, but if you saw the numbers that I saw, it's worth a try. So Cat City was given to me by our DA. She had the idea. She said, hey, check out the city of Oakland. They have this great program called Cat City, or Cat Town is what they call theirs. And what they do is they advertise that you can come in and have a cup of coffee and hang out in the cat playroom. 
and uh, their adoptions have skyrocketed. And so we checked into it, we've bought the coffee machine, and we're gonna ask for donations, and we're gonna rock and roll with it come January 1st, when we have our celebration of our anniversary. Technology and innovation, I, I did recently meet with the county individuals, our IT program, because we are, I think, about 10 years behind in what I call technology. And this, when we have canvassers that are going out, for example, into the communities, they go knocking door to door, door to door, they should be having live data in front of them. They should be having iPads. They should be able to see live data to determine if you have a current dog license uh, versus all the paper. And then they also have to come back to the shelter at the end of the day and handwrite citations. They shouldn't have to do that. It should be automated. Um, so we're looking at a lot of different things to make us more automated and more effective. Uh, education, we are pro-education. I know that we do some education here at Walter White School. The elementary school is kind of our testing school for the youngsters here. We're looking to do more education in the community. I go out and do the adult education and then we have staff members who um, enjoy going out to the schools for education. And education could be, there's a lot of community members who really truly don't know the laws of animal services as basic as your dog is required to be on a leash if it's off property. That is California law. Any questions or comments? Any questions? All right. No, thank you, Annette. We have somebody in the back there real quick. Mr. Yeakley, can you come up here? Because I can't hear what you're saying. Thank you. My name's Gene Yankley. You're talking about the facility on Crow's Landing Road, correct? Correct. I've been there in the past. I've actually captured some cats. And uh, by talking to people there, uh, they're explaining to me that if they're spayed or neutered, that sometimes they'll actually, because when you turn them in, you're supposed to put an address where you found them. Mm -hmm. They've actually told me that if they're spayed or neutered and they're not sick, that they'll actually turn them out in your neighborhood again. Is that correct? Mm -hmm. That is correct, if they've already been spayed or neutered. If they're not owner surrendered. Why? Why? Because we don't want to euthanize the cats anymore. Unless these, these animals are defecating on people's plants and trees and shrubs and killing them. And If they're causing problems, for one, we would offer you the cat stops. Because you're right, you have every right to protect your property, and we don't want the cats destroying your property. So we would offer you the cat stops. But we also would euthanize cats if they are causing some serious problems, as you explained. That just has to be shared with the shelter worker. Same for the dogs, too, right? They're turned into the neighborhoods where they're... Dogs are not. Dogs are not. Okay. No, dogs are not. Just cats. Just cats. Yeah. Yes. So we constantly have this turnover of cats that are fixed, but they're still in our neighborhoods. There's if they're not sick. If they're not sick, yeah. right. Right, we return them if they're not so sick. The they have to meet continues. weight programs, so they have to be at least four pounds before they can be released back. They can't be sick, and they can't be owner surrendered either. So then really in all reality, if the cats have been spayed or neutered, like there's a cat in my neighborhood and the people just left it, you know? So it wanders around, it might be populating the neighborhood too, but if they're spayed or neutered, if people leave them or abandon them or whatever, then the population starts to grow eventually, not as fast as mating, but they continue to grow, so we have more cats. That's why we need to spay and neuter them all. And then put them back on the street. And we put them back, because they have a shorter lifespan when they're living outside in the street. So we have to wait till they're dead in our front yard, right? All right, Ms. Sheekly, no, no, we're going to go ahead and move on. Thank you, Annette. I appreciate it. Thanks for all the things you guys do over there. All right. Citizen communication, all matters not included on the agenda. You have five minutes. While the city council welcomes and encourages participation in city council meetings, adopted rules allow no more than five minutes for expression of a non-agenda item. Matters under the jurisdiction for the city council and not on the posted agenda may be addressed by the general public. However, California law prohibits the city council from taking action on any matter which is not on the posted agenda until it is determined to be an emergency by the city council. Citizens are entitled to address the City Council on any agenda item subject to the five-minute provision. I do have a speaker's card, uh, Renee Ledbetter, with the Chamber. Good morning. Good morning. Good afternoon. It's been a long day. <laughs> Vice Mayor and Council Renee Ledbetter from the Series Chamber. Just wanted to remind you this Thursday is our third annual Series Fighting Cancer with Fire drive-through barbecue. 
Uh, we've held it two years over on Mitchell Road in front of Exit Realty. We're gonna be moving it over to River Oaks Golf Course. There's a little bit more room for us to spread out there. And uh, we encourage you, if you haven't purchased your tickets online, to do so. Uh, we're teaming up with the fire, fire department. The firefighters are gonna be out there barbecuing. And you can go online and purchase either a tri-tip or a chicken meal, individual or family pack. And you can choose your sides online and you can even tell us when you'd like to drive through and pick it up so that we can have it ready for you. So uh, we're really using technology as much as we can. Um, all the proceeds that the uh, net will go back to the Bill and Elsie Alum Cancer Endowment in Turlock. And uh, this is just an effort, again, that we are teaming up with the series firefighters to uh, promote breast cancer awareness. So we encourage you to uh, come out Thursday night. Hopefully it's not raining. It's not the World Series, but you could always buy a tri-tip dinner and have tri-tip sandwiches the next night. So uh, we encourage you to do that. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else? Leonard Shepard, 2841 Fowler Road. I really want to congratulate the series fire. Their, their efforts for breast cancer is amazing because last Tuesday night, I gave up another thing just to go and have some good food at La Mornita and support the and they're, they're, some of them are not the greatest waiting people, but they, were, they had heart and they were trying hard. But this effort for breast cancer is just amazing to me because it's not just Ceres, it's not Turlock, it's fire departments all over. Well, I was at the firefighter memorial on uh, the 17th of October and Sacramento Metro Fire Department had one engine that's entirely breast cancer pink. Advertisements for, you know, where you can donate and stuff. Sirius only had one little quarter panel, but that's awesome. Because they're doing something besides uh, saving lives through medical aids and fires and stuff. They're doing something that's proactive to help everybody, not just uh, the local citizens here, but they're doing an effort to save a lot of people from breast cancer. And don't think men can't get it too, they can. So I just wanna congratulate Chief Nichols and his department for going out and getting into the community and doing things to, to help and it also helps PR for the department, too, because they're out there and people are seeing them and knowing that they're doing something. So, uh, and I'm going to make an invitation to all of you from, not from Chief Nichols, but just from myself. Go visit your fire departments. Walk in, say hello. If they don't know who you are as members of the city council, <laughs> you need to educate them. Because some of them don't live here. A lot of them don't, but they work here and they protect us here. So you need to get to know them. And uh, they're, they're a great bunch of people. They're hardworking, they're dedicated, and they're just a great bunch of people. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else? My name is Jeannie Akeley. I live here in Ceres. I think Lori and the lady there has my address. Uh, I'm here tonight to, uh, yeah, I'm here to complain. Uh, the city here, when you uh, go up against uh, some people here for uh, running for office, they get this here. That's a guideline for a candidate. And in there, it has rules. And part of those rules is signage. Signage is very specific. Mr. T 
Tom Westbrook I've talked to. I've talked to uh, Lori over there about uh, the rules and the way they're played. There's uh, several people here in town that aren't going by the rules. And it's very specific. If you have somebody that you're designated that to, you sign a statement that you will do that or a possible fine. Once is OK, maybe twice, but several times over. And deliberately doing against the rules, I don't buy it. And in one property, it's owned by an, a national company. There was two signs put up there. I won't name the person or persons. There's another one that's in question that Toby Wells might know on a property on the southwest corner of Service and Mitchell. Supposedly by uh, today, the uh, property was still owned by the city, which was bought August 20, or was in the record at August 29th of 2014 with the county. So that would make that parcel there part of city property. Mr. Westbrook noted to me today that that would probably be a violation of the signage that people put out for political signs and series. So in doing that, so uh, people can, uh, you might want to pass this out to these people later so they can see. I want to start. There's no such thing as a cyclone. Uh, Gene, I can't hear you on the tape. I can't hear you on the tape. There's, there's no, there's no, there's some kind of conception in town here that there's something to do with a cyclone fence or if a commercial person has their fence line there that it's legal to put up signs wherever you want to. These are in total violation. The dimensions, uh, whether the foot is behind the sidewalk, the street, whether there's a sidewalk there or a, uh, a, a dirt road, 10 feet from the pavement from a dirt road where the surface starts, five feet from the sidewalk, those there in particular that I've handed out to you, total violation. It's not just one time, it's several times. And you know what? I had a lot of belief in people playing by the rules. But these people ain't playing by the rules. I know that everybody wants to win, but you don't win that way. I'd appreciate it if you pass those out to the, to the people in the audience so they can see. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else? All right, so we have no appointments to boards or commissions. Uh, anybody like to, uh, for a conflict of declaration? No? Consent calendar. calendar. All matters listed on the consent calendar are considered routine in nature and will be enacted by a single motion, unless otherwise requested by an individual council member or public for special consideration. Otherwise, the recommendation of the staff will be accepted and acted upon by roll call vote. Would anybody like to pull any? No? Anybody in the audience? Okay. We'll bring it back to the council for uh, action. Move for approval of 1, 2, 3, A, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. All right. Second. We have a first and a second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Uh, but the, oh, yeah. We, we do it. We do it the other way. There you go. Okay. Council Member Lane. Aye. Council Member Rhino? Yes. Council Member Klein? Yes. Vice Mayor DeRossi? Yes. Passes 401. Thank you. Unfinished business, none. Public hearing, nothing. New business. Adjustment to the water usage targets for October through March. As Jeremy's getting set up there, I'll we'll just provide a little, little background. <coughs> the uh, as we all know, uh, California has entered the fourth year of drought, and we're well, well into that. Um, when we set targets for the, uh, for the summer to try and meet the state-mandated cuts, um, we, we set some, some targets, and we're, we're back at council this evening to uh, revisit those targets that we set back in June. So I'll, I'll turn it over to Jeremy to give you some, some, a little bit more background. So at the June 8th council meeting, uh, council adopted resolution 2015-64 amending the penalty section of the municipal code that's adding fines for target exceedance so the current targets the current targets are set at uh, 27,000 April through September 27,000 gallons per month 7,000 October through March 
and then back to 27,000. So the, the goal is to have a 20, our, our goal is 28% reduction from June comparatively of this year to June of 13 through February. So as a whole, we're sitting about 25% as a state. It's interesting, as a state, three months into it, the state, the Water Board has reported that it's 600, 611,000 acre feet have been reduced, which is 51% of their overall goal. So we're a third of the way through the program and they're reporting that they've saved 50%. As a statewide average, the gallons per person per day per home is running at 102 to where the city of Sirius is at 103. Um, there's a couple of targets. So of the 406 water purveyors that are, that are reporting, 72% have either met or were within 1% of their goal. You know, so if, if we were at 27.1 or 2%, we would be within that category. We're in the 14% range where we were. We are within the one to 5%. There's several cities that are uh, a little bit lower than us. So the illustrations are, this is just some information that I was digging up. So the old, the Don Pedro old dam was built in 1923. Lake Don Pedro at that time held 289,000 acre feet of water. The new dam was built in 1967 to hold 2,030,000 acre feet. In 2014, the picture on the left, in 2014, the, the lake had 757,000 acre feet in it, 2014 in October. And this current month here, we're sitting at 636,000 in the lake, which is about 31% of capacity. So this illustration just kind of shows where we are gallons per person per day. So if you look at it, the information that um, is in 2015 is through the month of September. Comparing to 2013 to 2015, the, as in the executive, um, the executive order, we have a 24 to 25% reduction. Um, what's interesting is if you go back to 2007 to 2015, we're at 154% water reduced as a city. It's a big number. This illustration shows monthly over the last four months and then um, pro projecting October out where we are in our savings. So as you can see, June, of, June we were at 18%, 2732, we had a low spot in September of 19%. We're projecting 25% for this month and our average is actually gonna be right, right around 25% cumulatively. Water conservation. So water wasting fines in 2015 um, totaled up to be 1,329. Of those, 1,149 of them were for the wrong, watering on the wrong day. If you remember, we adopted rules that went from three days a week watering down to two days. That's what most of those are. Um, and out of all those, out of the 1,300 fines that were issued, there were only five that were in excess of $100. Um, 2015 courtesy notices, there was 1,251 courtesy notices delivered to the doors. Of those, 483 were a courtesy leak notification. So what that is is that the web portal generates leak alarms, leak alerts, and for those residents that aren't signed up for the web portal, um, that's what these are. We've gone door to door and handed these out, just as a courtesy so that they know that they're aware of what's going on. As you can see, the rebates, you know, 2014 rebates were a total of 140. 2015 rebates to date are 228. Um, what's kind of interesting here is that 21 of those are for the rebate program for uh, the turf removal that we offer. So our residents, they, they submit a plan to us. They, you know, offer different types of landscaping, different types of material where they're removing irrigated lawn. Um, they'll go back with bark, rock, some native plants. Um, it's pretty neat. They have, there's a lot of them. There's been a few that have actually installed the uh, turf grasses, but the most of them are going to bark or gravel. October this month, we did a, um, a California-friendly workshop. We had 50 residents, 50-plus 50 residents in attendance. Uh, six vendors gave presentation on drought-tolerant landscapes and equipment. Um, and we were given a grant by the D Department of Water Resources of $2,000 for that workshop.
So this here is the target fines issued to date. So from June through September, we, we issued, I think it's 1,600 um, fines, and 50% of those were warnings. So of those 50%, there was 25 to, there was a, six of them I believe were in excess of $100, not too many. So the water usage targets were implemented to educate. You know, our biggest goal is, is to educate the residents, create awareness, how the water's being used, where it's being used. So less than 5% of the residents have exceeded their targets June through September. Um, and, and the reason for this conversation is because during the month of October, the allotment dropped from 27,000 per household down to 7,000. Um, and with October being an abnormally dry month, I mean, there's no moisture, you know, the evaporation, the, the average evaporation rate for the month of October is about 3.5 inches per the month. Um, and we're sitting at almost six inches this month, they're saying. So it's just been extremely dry, no rain. You know, there's a forecast for rain on Wednesday that uh, whether it's gonna hit us or not, we don't know. So what we are projecting is that during the month of October, if we were to continue at uh, 7,000 gallons, we're projecting that the amount of fines to be issued are gonna be in the range of 6,558 fines. 50% of the households are gonna receive a fine. Um, if we were to reduce that, the allot or increase, I'm sorry, to increase the allotment from 7,000 to 22,000, allow the residents a little more outdoor watering because it has been so dry, that uh, target where the fines were issued to be somewhere around 345, about 5%. And again, the program was built to, to educate and create awareness of the water. And because the residents of Sirius have, you know, I mean, we're at a 25% reduction over the five months. Um, you know, we've, we've done our part. And the residents have done their part. So our goal is to, with, with council's recommendation, is to take the 27,000, instead of being 7,000 for the month of October, <coughs> becomes 22,000. And then for the months of November through February, become 12,000, rather than 7,000. So there's a little more, there's an increase during the winter months and then it ramps back up in March, and then sometime in February, Toby and I have talked about this a little bit, sometime in February we will be back to talk more about where we are with the state, whether they're gonna continue the program, whether they're gonna back off, you know. Them having a 51% savings in three months of their overall goal has to interpret something for us. And that's it, any questions? All right, council, have any questions? No. Anybody in the audience? Mr. Eakley, can you count up, please? Yeah, Jeannie Eakley from Sirius. We've talked before about the water usage and the program. I, maybe I wasn't hearing it right, but you were talking about the people and the usage and stuff like that. What I want to know is when these fines are going out, and the, hopefully these people are paying them, are these people going back into doing the same thing again? Have they learned a lesson or, or? Uh... No, it's, it's, if you go back to this slide here. So for the month of September, 230 residents received a fine. You know, and the fines, um, anytime you exceed, <clears throat> anytime you exceed 10%, um, it comes a warning. So. 50% of the 230 are warnings. The monetary ones are, there's about 100, 125 of them actually received a fine. Now, whether they're, some of them have been repeat offenders, not that many. Um, after the first fine or two, the $25, mm -hmm. they get it. We've had a few that are, um, continue to do it and they're paying the extra money. So this is, the fine process is actually working on the 10%? It is. You know, they get an e you know the, re the residents that are signed up for the portal get a notification at 10% that they've exceeded their allotment for the month. They don't start paying an increase until they hit 25% over their target, um, but they get it. Is this going into the regular utility bill or is this something separate? No. Okay. It goes in with the bill. You know, I could see there's a 10% there that probably doesn't read their utility bill completely, but. Oh, it's a 25, <laughs> yeah. it's a $25 fine. So they'll, yeah. you know, there's an abnormal amount because typically the water bills are pretty steady and if there's a $25 increase, they'll see it. All right, thank you. Mm -hmm. 
Any other questions? Bring it back to council. Well, I don't see a, a resolution or anything, but I, I do recommend that uh, we take action and increase um, the, the water uh, usage for uh, the changes for October through March and November through February. All right. I would agree. All right. So are we going to take that as a motion? Yes. Okay. Got a first and second. All those in favor? Oh, no. This goes back. Say aye. 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 We, we actually need to do a roll call. On we do the roll call. Now, yeah, I got to get used to the roll call. Okay. <laughs> roll call, please. Council Member Klein? Yes. Council Member Rhino? Yes. Council Member Lane? Yes. Vice Mayor DeRosset? Yes. Passes 401. Thank you. Any council member like to have a referral? All right, reports. I have nothing to report. Nothing, Vice Mayor. Okay. Nothing. Nothing. All right. Mr. Wells? Just a couple quick items. Um, the first one is the uh, workshop is being held this Thursday night here uh, in the council chambers on uh, groundwater management. So this is the new state law regarding uh, the sustainable groundwater agencies. And so that is a, a joint effort between the Turlock Groundwater Basin and a number of cities. Um, so the public is invited. We do ask for an RSP, RSVP. Um, you can contact Jeremy or the public works office and they can get that signed up for this Thursday evening to learn about how that law might affect uh, the community. A um, couple other things. The um, building permit was issued for Ross stores so they do indicate uh, an opening sometime in the middle of next year we didn't hoped it would happen a little sooner but they have finally pulled that permit um, and we did receive a submittal for the Save Mart uh, shopping center for the construction of those improvements that were approved uh, later last year several months ago so a couple of updates for us that are hopefully coming soon all right mr. Westbrook nothing mr. Jordan chief Smith Chief Nichols? Mr. Dumas? You give us a report. Ms. Dean? Nothing. Um, I'm forgetting. Mr. Hallam? Nothing there. Mr. Steve? Nothing. Mr. Britton? No. Mr. D. Martini? All right. Okay. Well, we're going to join to the next regular scheduled city council meeting. It's scheduled to be held on Monday, November 9th, 2015 at 6 p.m. in the city council chambers. Have a good night.